He was born in, I think, 1927. That might not be the exact year, but that's about the right time. Uh, and uh, his name was Duk Lin Li, and his uh, family was actually Christian. And he grew up at a time where Korea was dealing with uh, uh, Japanese imperialism, Japanese invasions. And as a young man, he grew very discontent because uh, Duk In Li himself had been uh, kind of a, a freedom fighter. And as soon as Korea finally became independent of Japan, uh, he observed Korean people starting to fight with each other. And this really hit his mind very hard as far as uh, what could be done with politics and also human nature. And it, it really, it broke his heart. He, it's a story he told often. Uh, it really broke his heart to see his countrymen after having to band together and throw off this uh, oppressor, suddenly starting to fight each other. And then of course he saw the, the uh, partition of Korea. Uh, and so he actually gave up uh, philosophy, which he had studied very hard, and he gave up politics and decided, I'm going to cut my hair, become a Buddhist monk, and I'm going to address this question of life and death itself. And so he went to the mountain, and he was a young guy, and he was very passionate and very angry, and he really threw himself into some intensive practices, some uh, ascetic practices, and... Uh, uh, really pushed himself and his body really hard. In fact, we kind of think that this uh, this solo retreat he did, it was a hundred days where he pretty much subsisted on pine needles. Uh, not kidding. Uh, some people think that that kind of harmed his body and affected his health for the rest of his life and, of course, set the stage for the way we had to say goodbye to him. Uh, and so he became uh, a, a monk, and he received transmission from a teacher, Kobong Sinim, and um, was a very active teacher and led a bunch of temples. He even had a, he was even abbot of a temple in Japan. And there are all kinds of stories I won't get into now about him during this period, but what happened at, at a certain point is that he decided to come to the United States and this was uh, in 1970, 71, he made this decision that he wanted to come to America and teach American Zen. And uh, uh, one story I've heard is that somebody asked him, why do you want to do that? You, know, you could stay here, you're abbot of all these temples, your life is pretty, you're, you have a good situation, you know? And he said, I want to go to America because I think Americans, my teacher told me, um, go to where people are suffering and then teach them. And he said, and I think Americans suffer a great deal. And a lot of Buddhist teachers were coming. This was the period that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche and Suzuki Roshi, I think, well, Suzuki Roshi was already here, but a lot of teachers were coming from the East because there was this generation of Americans who were very adventurous and trying all kinds of new things, but they didn't have this historic knowledge of Buddhism. So their minds were a little bit more open and a little more clear. They didn't have a lot of understanding about Buddhism. And so uh, Sung San showed up here with hardly any English. And he, took a, he needed money, so he took a job uh, repairing laundry machines at a Korean-owned laundromat in Providence, Rhode Island, which Providence had a, still has a pretty large Korean population. So he rented a bad apartment in this shabby part of town, worked his laundromat job, and he put a sign on the door of the house just saying, Zen. And eventually people found him, and slowly this group formed around him. And he gradually learned a few more English words, and he added a few things, and that became Providence Zen Center eventually. And so... As that grew, he started traveling, and more centers and more groups appeared, sort of like mushrooms, wherever he went. And, uh, um, and then the time eventually came when he went back to Korea and spent most of his time there. And 
he had uh, health problems. He had diabetes. He had a heart issue. I think the diabetes medication affected his heart or vice versa. And, um, and eventually we were actually able to build our own temple in the mountains of Korea and uh, provide housing for our teacher there. And uh, he passed away in 2004. Zen Master Sung Sun taught don't know mind. That was his essential teaching, before thinking mind. That if we return to before thinking, then everything is clear. We have this, um, I don't even know what to call it, but a, a mechanism in our school, we, that's returning to zero. Sometimes we say pushing the clear button on the calculator. And when you do that, everything you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think, everything is truth. The true self is already apparent. But our thinking mind, our attachment to our feelings, our attachment to our beliefs and ideas, block it. So if you let go of your attachments, it's already here. So don't know mind is a, it's a kind of a mind of wonder, a mind of curiosity, a mind that's not attached to things, allows you almost automatically to express your true nature. And that was his teaching. Now there was his teaching and there was him, the man. And for me, and this is very personal for me, other people have a much different feeling for him. We talk about him, you know, this is the 10 year anniversary of his death and we're gathering to celebrate him. Everybody had a different experience. For me, being around Zen Master Sung San was, made the world surreal. It was funny. He was so alive. He was the most alive person I ever met. And being with him, somebody once said, with, with Zen Master Sung San, every day was a big day. Everything, even going to lunch, was just an alive, incredibly absorbing experience. So I just enjoyed being around him. And his teaching language spoke to me. But it was really his presence and his aliveness that I responded to. He always said, I don't teach Buddhism, I don't teach Zen, I only teach don't know. Which is very easy to repeat, right? <laughs> it's almost like a slogan. Um, but really, uh, a lot of his... Uh, it, was, it was so central to his teaching that people be able to just hit the clear button, um, clear all of the junk going on in our minds from moment to moment, just cutting through that off and returning to the mind that is uh, clear like space, as Da Wei put it, this clear as the sky. Um, and then you can perceive your situation very clearly. But he didn't stop there. He said, then, well, once your mind is clear, your direction also has to be very clear. So once you perceive this world clearly, what do you do? So he said, your original mind is like a, is like a mirror, right? And so, you know, red comes red, green comes green. If you're hungry, what do you do? Eat. Someone else is hungry, and that shows up in your mirror. What do you do? Give them food. Right? So he was always connecting this, this primary point teaching, which is, you know, clear mind or no mind. Uh, some Zen schools might, you know, call that mushim. Uh, uh, but then also not stopping there, but actually also using that to make your life and your function clear in every single moment. And then you are actually attaining and manifesting the life of a bodhisattva, right? So he said that that is, uh, that is the truth, that is the way, and that is the life. <laughs> he, was, he was teaching in English while he was learning English. So... To us, it sounded like he was speaking Pidgin English. But I think the beauty of what that did is it made his teaching quite simple. <laughs> he loved children. Uh, he would... <laughs> he, he loved children and he would really talk to them. Um, Sung San was a person who really believed that we're all coming back. And so when he saw children, even pets, you know, it was always welcome back. And he would talk to children about life and death, and, and he would make them laugh, and, and, and he was really wonderful with them. Uh, he did not urge parents to do things like force their children to meditate or anything like that. 
he he suggested at a certain time when the child felt it was appropriate maybe have them sit with you for three minutes four minutes five minutes and then he said do some tai chi together i remember that he also bowing together because children love bowing and uh he said that was you know it comes back to together action he was really more imp it was mostly important for parents to find ways to do together action with their children as opposed to making their children fit into how adults practice uh, finding ways for parents and children to do things together and uh, and just answer their questions i'm a i'm a parent i have a, i'm a parent in a mixed faith household my wife is christian and we have two boys and six years old and three years old and they're just starting to notice that mama and papa do these different things and they are starting to ask questions and what we always said was we would just take each question as it came and when they started asking questions well that means they're ready for answers to those questions um, and that that's pretty much what Sung San suggested that parents do and of course, bringing the kids to ceremonies and events at the Zen Center as much as possible. Now, of course, they have a Sunday school program, but that's <laughs> that's because now we have lots and lots of kids. In the early days, there weren't as many. Don't make anything means don't add anything. You know, and I think this is very much traditional Zen. There's the thing, and then there's the commentary about the thing. So anything that happens, there's the experience. Again, that's what this is about. It's returning to the experience itself rather than the story about the experience. So don't make anything means don't add to it. Just return to the thing itself. So even if it's a very difficult, painful moment, return to the difficult, painful moment. Don't, cre don't live in the story of what the painful moment means. Just return to the experience itself. Well, the quantum school of Zen really was just a way to organize all of these various centers and groups that were uh, inspired by Zen Master Sung San's teaching. Zen Master Sung San was this Korean teacher who traveled all over the place. So in the old days, you would go and see the Zen master, but Zen master Sung San would fly everywhere. And everywhere he went, he would give a talk, he would lead a retreat, and then he would say, you must start a group. And so uh, you ended up with lots and lots of centers and groups all over the place. This is still true, actually, even now that he's gone. And so the quantum school of Zen was organized as a way to network and communicate and support all of these groups and also keep everybody on the same page in terms of um, what the teachings are and our forms of practice, uh, how we deal with teaching authority and positions within the, the centers and groups. And so really the Quantum School of Zen is, is just preserving that unique teaching of Zen Master Sung San's. And how, how large of an organization is it today? Ooh. Um, there are, uh, there are now, it's now large enough that there are actually regional schools. Um, uh, there's easily more than a hundred uh, centers and groups around the world. Um, so there's a North American school. There is a European school. Um, there's also an Asian school, and the Asian school, I believe, includes um, a couple of centers in Africa and possibly Australia. I'm not too sure about that, but we have centers and groups around the world, and we have regional organizations to kind of help gather everybody, also to pool resources uh, so that we can keep teachers moving around and everybody has an opportunity to do some hard training. But there was, there was an issue with Zen Master Sung San, um, who had been in a relationship with at least one person, maybe a couple more, that I know of. And I, I don't know the full history. I, I was kind of, the thing that I would like to, the most important part of it to me was the way Zen Master Sung San handled it. Because I was right there. Because what happened was, 
one of the people in my Zen center heard about the relationship from somebody who had left the, the Providence Zen Center. I was, in our system, the abbot is not the teacher. The abbot is an administrative head of the school, of the Zen Center, maybe more like a president. I was probably 33, 34 at the time, and a, the woman at my Zen Center had heard the story, came to me and told me, and she said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, what do you mean, what am I going to do about it? I was a little afraid of Zen Master Sung Song. She said, well, you're the abbot, what are you going to do? And I said, well, okay, I guess I have to do something. So one morning before Bows, he was in Los Angeles, I was up here in Berkeley, I called him. And I told him what I'd heard. I told him what had happened. And just like anybody, I would imagine, I'd call it he got defensive, but he started shouting. I mean, literally, I put the phone out here. He was yelling so loud. And then it was bowing time, and he hung up. And I was like, whoa, what was that? Fifteen minutes later, the phone rang. It was him. And he said, okay, what do you want me to do? I said, well, I think you should come to Berkeley and you should talk to us. We should have a meeting of the members and talk to us. He said, okay, I'll come. And I don't know how long it was the next week. I don't, I don't know exactly. He came up and the room was different, but just like this, he and I sat in front of the altar and I spoke a little bit about what had happened and he spoke a little bit and people asked him questions. At the end of the meeting, some people were satisfied, some people weren't. Probably a fair amount of people left. My subjective view is that a lot of the people who left were halfway out the door anyway. It was a tumultuous time in the Zen Center that this happened. Um, and then we went on. He, what impressed me, and helped me stay was that we dealt with it. You know, there's a difference between a predator and somebody who is sexual. So I don't know what I don't know. I hate when I say that because Donald Rumsfeld said that. But um, so I can't say whatever happened. But the things that I knew about were or relationship type things. It wasn't like some of the other stories, and I've heard firsthand some stories, where in, in some of these instances, in other schools, there was, in the midst of interviews, or in dokusan, as they would call it in Japanese, these sexual things were done. I've never heard anything like that. I think the thing that bothered people the most was a feeling of hypocrisy, that every beat, I don't think he ever said, I am celibate. But people assumed, being that he was a monastic, that he was celibate. So it was that kind of what felt like hypocrisy that bothered people. As I understand it in Asia, and maybe Korean specifically, but I think Asia in general, they have a very strong sense of public and private. That in private, it's nobody's business. It's how you keep yourself in public. In America, we're not like that. How you keep yourself in private impacts how we think of you in public. And I think a lot of these, well, I can't speak for the other teachers, but I think for Zen Master Sung San, he got caught up in that cultural difference a little bit. I think he was feeling it was private, and Americans didn't view it as private. But again, the thing that impressed me the most was his willing his willingness to be straightforward with it and deal with it. We don't exactly have a curriculum. It's, it is, I think he was affected by what he saw in Japan. So in some ways there's a similarity. And I remember talking to one of a fellow teacher and, and I think he was a, well, I know he was a, um, Dharma era, Vakan Roshi, and he did some Kumon training with Zen Master Sungtan, and he said there's a pretty good similarity. Um, but we don't go through all of the books. We have 12 Kumons that are, um, if you call it a curriculum, we call them homework, 
that people work on for quite a long time. There was one that I worked on, I say nine years, I don't think it was probably that long, but. And then we have a vast assortment of other koans. He's, he says in his teaching that there are 1,700 traditional Chinese koans. He uses some of the Tao Te Ching as koans. He's got some Christian koans. And then we as teachers make up koans for our students for an interview, which are just like one-line questions. Sometimes they may be something from the sutras. Sometimes they may be something from everyday life. So in our style, a kungun can, there are, can be an infinite number of them, actually. But for a teacher, you have to be able to answer the 12 kunguns plus this probably three or four others. Um. Can, one more thing about the kunguns. Um, our school focuses on what we call correct situation, correct relationship, and correct function. And kungans will, will connect with one of those three things. Correct function is how you live everyday life. And that's the most important thing. So the, the more complex or the difficult kungans tend to be function questions. It's like, how do you respond in a clear way to a particular situation? So, so a little variant of that, we talk about substance, truth, and function. When you said don't make anything, you asked me about that. If you don't make anything, that points you to truth. Function is how, to f how that truth functions. So our, our kongons are really connected with substance, which is really before thinking. You can't even name it. Then truth, just as it is, and then how that functions. And that relates to your... When you, when you want to take truth and make it function, and, and if I am the, the object or the subject, I guess, what's, what's important is my relationship to the situation. So for example, you and I are sitting here in the Zen Center. If somebody breaks into the Zen Center, I have a particular relationship to the Zen Center that requires me to do something. You have a much different relationship. So your function to what happens would be much different than the function that I have. And discerning that difference is often quite important. A lot of times we get in trouble in our lives because we act outside of what our relationship is to the situation. So clarity means understanding what the situation is, perceiving what my relationship to that situation is, and then finding my correct function determined by that situation and relationship. And the kungans touch into that. Doing what is appropriate. I'm sorry? Doing what is appropriate. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But the appropriate may not be conventional. It comes from clarity. It comes again. It's the manifestation of the true self. When Zen Master Sung Sung was asked, what's the purpose of Zen? He said, attain your true self and help this world. So the Bodhisattva way Kwan Sein Bosal is the Korean name for um, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Kwan Yin in Chinese. And it's, it, our, our task in life is to actually be Kwan Sein Bosal. And that gives our life direction and an orientation. This is good to talk about. I'll try to do this justice because Sung San taught koan practice in a, in a different way than some other schools. And uh, I think that's an interesting conversation to have. He, it, he explains this in his own words, and better than I will, in a book called um, The Whole World is a Single Flower. And it was a collection of uh, kungans, 365 kungans. And then at the back, he wrote a, an essay about koans, um, which is better than me, so go find that. But <laughs> I'll try to summarize it uh, um, awkwardly or not awkwardly. What he, what he noticed about Kangan practice, and um, I guess I'll start at the beginning. I mean, uh, koan means uh, a public case, right? And the uh, etymology of it is, is uh, the word is describing the wax seals that were used to authenticate documents. 
So you'd put a wax seal on a, on a document, and then if you were making an official copy, you'd sort of put this seal across both uh, copies of the document and then break them away so that if you wanted to authenticate it, you could just line up the two halves of the wax and say, oh, okay, this is, you know, this is a genuine copy. So, uh, and so this was now translated into an interaction between a teacher and a student and an interaction in that it's not just the teacher dumping knowledge into a student's brain. It was an interaction. And, uh, and uh, in English translations, you, you read about this mind-to-mind -mind transmission, this mind-to-mind -mind connection. And the way Sung San explained that was, you know, if you hear this sound, you know, if I take a stick and I hit this table, you know, and I do that, and we're not expecting it, right? For one instant, you hear this sound and I hear this sound. And our minds are just... And so for that instant, our minds are the same. And he said, that is one instant of world peace. Your mind, my mind are not separate. And there's a connection there and that this is true peace. And so we both just heard that dog. And so for one instant, our minds were the same. Right? So that's true peace. And it just... So that's just one instant. <laughs> right? So koan practice is about helping, uh, helping our, our, our minds come together for just this instant and to see our life very clearly, just in that moment right in front of us. So that's all fine. But then what Sung San noticed was that as people became very uh, knowledgeable about koans and developed a certain expertise, that koan language could become jargonized. It could become very facile and easy and clever. And you have people talking about the rabbit playing the flute and, and the cow with no nostrils, but only some people even know what that means. That means something, but some people don't even know what that is. And so it becomes very specialized. If you know the language and you know the metaphors, you have an in that other people don't. And Sung San thought, that doesn't help our life. Right? That, doesn't, that doesn't help us connect to our life. And so uh, he really wanted to use Kongans as a way of opening the door and waking up and attaining true direction, true function. So how does the Kongan help you see correct relationship, correct situation, and correct function in this moment? And then if you can see it in this moment, carry that into the next moment. Right? So he taught Kongans in a very different way. And so uh, an answer that might be completely appropriate under a teacher in a different school for Sung San was beside the point or scratching your right foot when the left one's itching. And so while it is, you know, it's certainly possible and, and maybe even beneficial to practice with um, different teachers, in our Kwan Un school, our Kung An practice is a little bit different. It has a slightly different emphasis and a slightly different direction. And even formally, it's a little bit different. Um, and that's the, that's the direction of it. And I think for a better explanation, you can go find Sung San's essay about it. It's amazing. It's actually a, a wonderful piece of writing, and I think it's not widely known about. That book, I think, is all, I think it's out of print, actually. And so this essay is kind of lost, but I, I think it's a very interesting uh, consideration of Kung An practice as an actual practical um, and very democratic <laughs> uh, kind of way. You know, he was always very concerned that people would get very good at answering kungans, but when someone was rude to them in the supermarket, they would completely lose their center. Right? And I've seen students, I'll be honest, I won't name names, but I have seen students who are very, uh, um, very experienced with kungan practice and had really attained... <laughs> uh, high positions of authority in the institution because of their accomplished Kung An practice. And they were beautiful in the interview room, but on Main Street um, could very easily lose their center to the first rude New Yorker 
who shoved them or something, right? And so that doesn't help. And for Sung San, it's like, that's not correct practicing. You know, you have to be able to, you know, you have to be able to keep clear mind and to keep your direction clear and live, how can I help you, even when some guy is yelling at you, even if he's pointing a gun at you. Otherwise, what are we doing? Yeah, let's talk about that. That's very good. Um, so Sung San, very early on, made a clear distinction between monk and lay practice. I think he did a fairly good job of making sure that one was not valued more than the other, although people, of course, did value more than one or the other. Some people really emulate monks, and some people really think monks are just, eh. <laughs> you know, found some kind of virtue in being a lay person, but the, neither is correct. <laughs> Monk and lay is just, these are different life situations. And so uh, in our school, if you're a monk, then you shave your head, you only wear a certain clothing that monastics wear in our tradition, and they are the same as what Korean monks wear. And um, you take uh, precepts you know, from the Vinaya, you follow the, the Vinaya precepts that Buddha laid down for his monks and uh, put that into practice in our modern world. And it's very clear. And so you go through the traditional Buddhist monastic stages of being a, a Sami and then a, and then a Bhikshu and Bhikkhu and you know, et cetera. Um, and then alongside that, he um, also defined a lay track where people uh, may take greater commitments, take uh, greater increments of precepts. So we break up the precepts into smaller increments than some schools do. You take five precepts first. And then at a later stage you can take ten. Then you can take sixteen later and you can actually take the sixty-four bodhisattva precepts from the Brahmajala Sutra. And um, I'm on this lay track so I've got hair um, but I'm only supposed to keep my hair about this long and in even really shorter. I get a little bit of leeway because I'm an actor, so sometimes I have to grow it out and do crazy things with my appearance. But, um, but generally speaking, for a bodhisattva teacher, we keep our hair very short. Um, we have precepts and uh, we are expected to have a very clear relationship with our local Zen center. If there's not a local Zen center, well then, uh, you're starting a group, aren't you? <laughs> practicing publicly, practicing and making your practice available to other people. So you have to do the work of balancing your family life and whatever professional obligations you have with being in training as a Zen student, spending eight days uh, a year on retreat, finding a way to do a, a three-month kilche as part of your training, um, you know, consi you know uh, consistently checking in with your teacher, giving talks, um, leading a group, all of these things. Um, that's what's expected of us. So you know, you're a, you may be a, on the lay track, but you have a job to do and a very clear relationship with your center. And so uh, he created those two tracks and kept them very clear and distinct. So some Zen schools, there's a little confusion. What does it mean to be a monk? What does it mean to be a priest? And there are answers to those questions, but sometimes people aren't very clear. In our school, you just look at the person's head, right? And you can tell, oh, he's a monk, right? It's very clear. And at ceremonies, we wear different things, so it's even clearer. Um, but they're both highly valued and very important. And what has happened is that we have found that um, we have a few Western monks um, in our school still, and for the most part, they're at our temple in Korea. Um, it's been, it proved very difficult to nurture that in the United States. And I think at this point, we're not actively trying anymore to have a North American monastic Sangha. So some people become monks, they spend most of their time in Korea. There are only a couple. Um, I can think of three in our school who are monks and live in North America. And that was mainly because it was very hard to build. Um, there's a case to be made that in American culture, 
there are very few people who really understand that monastic commitment and can do it. And you need a community to support it. And we just didn't, we weren't able to build that here. So we have that in Korea. And for the most part, our Sangha is dominated by this lay track of mm. Dharma teachers who um, uh, bring family life and professional life and temple life together into one big cauldron. And we sort of melt in this cauldron and uh, hopefully become something useful to all beings. In the Quanum school of Zen, and this comes actually from Sung San himself, Sung San thought to himself, well, there's a problem with that too, which is that what if a teacher is not really that clear, or um, what if there's some question? Um, uh, for instance, uh, even the, the transmission to the fifth patriarch, um, which, uh, I mean, he had to go and run away and hide because there were people who might kill him, right? Uh, that whole story. Um, so Sung San thought better to make it about, again, the Sangha and have more than one teacher weigh in. And so the process we have is still the process that he developed, um, which is that, uh, for instance, we break up transmission into two stages. So we have what we call Inca, and this is different than other Zen schools. What we call Inca means you become a, a Jita Popsa, a master Dharma teacher. You can teach koan practice. You can be a precepts teacher and give people precepts. But you cannot give transmission. You cannot give Inca or transmission yet. And you're not considered yet a fully independent teacher. You are practicing in this role as a teacher and taking on teaching responsibilities. But you're still... Uh, uh, you're still getting some guidance, I guess, and still opening up your own practice, by the way, and starting to uh, um, deepen this mature stage of your own practice. And so to get Inca, um, your guiding teacher, Zen Master Ono, says to Adam, I think maybe you're ready to start being a Jita Pope Sa. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to send you to these four other teachers in our school. And so if these four teachers also think you're ready, then we're going to move on to the public Inca ceremony. And then the Inca ceremony is where you, Adam, sit and anybody at the ceremony, and there could be 200 people at our ceremonies, anybody can come up and ask you a question in front of everyone. And you must answer clearly and simply manifesting your clear Kung on mind and your understanding of the teachings and just your own practice. And really the questions and answers, they're entertaining, but they're not important. What everyone's looking at is just how you receive questions, how you respond, and, and your practicing mind becomes very clear. Also your teaching direction. If you pass that test, then you get Inca. And they give you a different colored casa to wear and you give your first dharma speech and boom now you're adam jita pope Sanim. so that's how we do inca but not yet a zen master so after a certain number of years the senior teachers in the school might look and say okay adam pope Sanim is maybe ready for um transmission and at that stage, you actually have to go outside the school and practice with teachers in other traditions. This is something I really appreciate a lot. I've, we were talking before about keeping your mind open, right? Sung San said, you, you, now you must go and you have to go and practice with other teachers and do Kung An practice with them and report back how those exchanges went and, and you know, really train with others. Uh, and so you pass that gate and some time goes by and then there's a period of rest and then it's possible to have a, uh, a transmission ceremony. And at that point you have the title Zen Master and some people stay and teach in the Quantum School of Zen and several have decided, I want to teach a, a slightly different way and so they've gone off and started their own schools. There have been uh, three or four people who've done that. So that's how we do that. And so it's really by committee. And it's very much um, 
what I appreciate about it and think is uh, very strong about it is that it's not just one person giving somebody the title and position, but it's actually the Sangha that is examining someone, testing them, vetting them, and saying, okay, he's ready, she's ready. <laughs>
the steps of each ceremony and our meal form and things like that. Being Just paying attention to the details of how we do what we do. Not in a compulsive kind of way, but as a way of just paying attention and caring for everything that we come in contact with.